Hey friends, welcome to The Jill Monaco Show. I'm your host, Jill, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm a speaker, author, and life coach. Some weeks, I share what God is teaching me, and other times, I invite a friend to join me on the podcast, and we chat about what it means to love God, love ourselves, and love others. Here we go. Hey, everyone. Welcome to 2020. If you've been following my podcast at all, you know that we took a break for the second half of 2019, mostly due to my speaking and travel schedule. And this was our first one, our first new podcast of the new season. Woohoo! I have so many new interviews already recorded, so be sure to click that button on your phone or computer that says subscribe so you don't miss a future episode. Now, if you're new here, welcome. I'm Jill Monaco. I'm a speaker, certified life coach, and the author of the book Freedom Coach Model. Lately, people have been saying I'm sort of a prophetic breakthrough strategist. I love helping people become who God created them to be. There is nothing more exciting than seeing lies break off you, replacing fear with faith and discouragement with really good God dreams. I work with individuals who want to break through to the next level in their walk with God, in their relationships, in their finances, and in their life. I also work with church leadership teams to help train them to minister to their folks through the tools I've created and what I've trademarked as freedom coaching. It's a blend of best practices in coaching and ministry. If you want to chat about how I can serve you, you can reach out to me at jill at jillmonaco.com. Now, before we get started with my next guest, I want to invite you to do a few things. First, head over to jillmonaco.com and sign up for my newsletter. You'll get notified when a new podcast or blog drops, and you'll get a quarterly newsletter that shares all the insider info about what God is doing in and through the ministry. As a 501c3 nonprofit, we offer resources that will encourage you to encounter the presence of God and find freedom in Christ. We have things like audio teachings and workbooks, free courses, and so much more. And 2020 is going to be so much fun. There's lots of new things coming your way and things to share, but I'm not really all that organized at sending emails, you know, like the ones you get daily, multiple times, or even weekly. So I promise you, you're not going to get that many emails from me because I just find those personally annoying. But I wanted to start the year off with a message that would make you feel empowered in the new year. We love a fresh start, right? I believe how we start sets a tone for what comes next. If we keep our eyes on the path that Jesus shows us, then we can celebrate the small things and be encouraged to keep going. I know when I've had some wins, the challenge is, eh, they don't faze me as much. But I also know so many of you are coming into 2020 exhausted from a difficult 2019. You don't know where to start or how to pick yourself back up. So I asked a new friend of mine to come on the show and encourage you. If you're struggling, if you're just doing okay, or even if you're excited for this year, you don't want to miss this episode. In fact, get ready to hit the share button or copy and paste the URL. You are going to see God's mighty hand and want to share it with others too. Sula Skiles has a passion for ministry that comes from overcoming a very painful past. She has found freedom and healing from the traumas of her life and has been radically transformed by becoming a fiery believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. As a survivor of sex trafficking, she works to spread awareness, teach prevention, and help victims and survivors of trafficking. Sula uses her story to help others find the same freedom she has found. It is her joy to advance the kingdom of God with the love and the power of the gospel. She ministers in faith to see Jesus miraculously heal people. She loves the presence and the glory of the Lord. Sula invites people into deeper intimacy with Jesus as the bridegroom king. Sula is also a pastor and the author of two books, Fighting for Your Purpose, and His Beloved Bride, 
a journey into deeper intimacy with Jesus. Sula is happily married to Pastor John Mark Skiles, and together they are church planters that started Impact Life Church in Destin, Florida, and they have two beautiful children. On the podcast today, you'll hear Sula's story. My prayer is that you'll be so wrecked with the love of God and leave passionate to sit at the feet of Jesus. Ready? Let's chat with Sula. Sula, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, we have common friends and have been meaning to connect. And what the listeners don't know is this is really our first time chatting, uh, you know, on an audio form. <laughs> I know it doesn't feel like it though. It's it's so fun when you meet people in the body of Christ and you feel like I've known you. I've I feel mm-hmm. like I know you already, and that's just I think the beauty of like the family of God. You know, you don't yes. meet a stranger. <laughs> totally, and we have some similar backgrounds too. Um, yeah. and my listeners know I've mentioned a few times I was an actor in uh, before ministry, and you went to L.A. to pursue acting as well when you were young. Yes, absolutely. I sure did. I didn't have as much experience as you did, but I definitely um, jumped into the acting and modeling scene. And um, boy, that's a huge part of my testimony, uh, Mm -hmm. which I know we'll get into here in a little bit. But um, yeah, yeah, I I love that, that we both have some similar things in our our background. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I did mention in the intro that you and your husband and two kids live in Florida and you pastor a church. Um, what led you guys to be church planters? That's a, like a really big, <laughs> it's a big challenge. <laughs> it sure is. It's very rewarding, but definitely, um, definitely a challenge. Yeah. Um, actually, my husband had been um pastoring at uh, my father-in-law or uh, his parents' uh, church in Missouri for 17 years before Mm -hmm. we planted a church here. And that was just a really beautiful God story. We were actually on vacation in Destin and the Lord started stirring his heart. We were not expecting to um, plant our own church because, you know, mom and dad had always kind of prepped us that we would be the next ones to mm. um, lead the church where we were faithfully serving and and loved, you know, uh, serving it there. And so um, the Lord threw kind of like a holy curveball. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, um, but we had um, our pastors and, you know, their parents, um, blessing and dad already knew that God would be sending us out. So we really Mm -hmm. just were following the voice of God. And that's really how we live our lives. You know, when God speaks, no matter how he speaks, we want to follow his voice and and, um, obey to the best of our ability. So it really Mm -hmm. just came from an encounter with the Lord and a calling to come and plant a church here. And um, it's been really beautiful. We're just over five years old and um, started a church from from scratch. <laughs> wow. Uh, and it's been quite a journey. It's been very humbling. We've learned so much. And the greatest thing is that we get to encounter God and we see so many come to the Lord and um, encounter the fullness of His kingdom and healing mm. miracles and freedom. And it's beautiful to see God do what He does best. Oh, man, that's awesome. And you know, you're suffering there on the beach in Destin because it's just (laughs) such an ugly place to live. (laughs) It's so funny you say that. People have said that before. They're like, okay, so let me get this straight. (laughs) You heard God to move to Destin. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Yeah, right. Exactly. As I'm sitting here in Chicagoland, it's 16 degrees outside today, you know. Um, (laughs) I'm so sorry about that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm suffering for Jesus here. (laughs) <laughs> but, um, well, there's so much joy and and peace just in your voice and, and from what I've seen online. Um, and if anyone knew what you had gone through, there's no way that you should be the kind of person you are with the life that you have in Christ um, if it weren't for him. I mean, yeah. and I'm excited for people to hear it because I truly believe, even as we talked briefly before we start recording, um, there are people out there right now, and I just want to set this up that you may have come across this podcast because someone recommended it to you, or you might be listening to it for the first time and don't even know how you landed here. 
But God wants to show you that he is in your story, that he's not forsaken you, he's not abandoned you, um, and that you are nobody has done anything too far gone for Jesus to not redeem and restore more than you lost, right? Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Yes, that's that's so good. Um, I am definitely one of those people now that, but as you said, you never guess what I've been through. And in fact, when I do share my story for the first time with people that have known me for a little while, um, they are just saying, I would have never guessed that. And that's just mm-hmm. the power of the gospel. It's the power of the love of God and how, mm-hmm. you know, he truly does make all things new. Um, for me, uh, my story started out, you know, as a baby at 18 months old, um, sexual abuse started for me. Mm-hmm. And my first memories in life are of sexual abuse and big body parts on my little body parts and being, you know, shoved under blankets and, and told to sit in closets and so many mattresses on the floor. And I have these glimpses of these moments. And those are my first memories in life. Um, You know, I have a very powerful, strong mom and she was a single mom at the time, you know, raising me to the the best, doing the best that she could going to school and working so hard, you know, to work and provide for me as a single mom. And so she relied on people that she trusted to also watch me at times to babysit me. And so that's where a lot of the abuse would happen. Um, so my childhood was was actually, you know, full of a couple of different abusers at different times. And it kind of felt like the cycle of abuse and being victimized was, it was almost, it felt like I was being targeted, you know, yeah. um, by the enemy. And I had, so I had a lot of um, just dark moments in my childhood, but growing up, I I kind of learned how to um, cut off and like, and just kind of, I guess really it was suppress all of the, the hard things that were happening. And I really was like thriving at school. I was always very social, always really loved people. And, um, but just going through cycles of trauma and pain. And by age 12, um, I had, been really searching and wandering um, on this really a spiritual journey because I was aware that the spirit realm was very real because I had had, mm. um, you know, attacks and stuff by demonic things in my childhood that yeah. came with the abuse. Me too. And so I was always searching in the spirit realm for what, for something because my family, you know, they weren't believers. And so by age 12, I actually became a Wiccan because I knew the spirit realm was was real. I got into tarot cards and Wicca and all of this stuff. And anyway, um, that led to um, severe depression and being suicidal because that whole dark demonic world opened up like with the vengeance. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I was I ended up in a mental institution at 12 years old. Um, because I was suicidal, didn't want to live anymore. I'd been through so much sexual abuse and depression by that point that I just didn't want to live anymore. Um, And so um, coming out of that, my first boyfriend uh, was uh, at 14. And I remember what on his birthday, what he wanted for his birthday was my virginity. And I had already been sexually abused so much in my childhood that I was scared to say no. I was scared to uh, resist because of the consequences that would happen. And so I ended up pregnant for the first time at 14. And it was decided by my family that I would get um, an abortion. And so, you know, it just, again, it seemed like these cycles and these cycles of just pain and trauma and just difficult things going on. Now at school, that was the one thing I really like loved about myself was that I knew how to do good in school. So I had this whole world of, um, of pain and toxic relationships and alcohol and drug addiction, um, this whole secret life. But then as far as my school knew, and as far as my parents knew, I mean, they knew that I would withdraw into my room all the time, but they had no idea what was really going on because my grades were so good. I was taking college courses while in high school. I was, um, 
you know, got nominated for programs at, and, and went to Stanford, a program at Stanford mm-hmm. and UCLA for, you know, medical students and things like that while I was in high school. So from the outside looking in, it, you know, it really looked like I had it all together, yeah. but I was really struggling with mental illness and addiction and bad relationships. And, um, you know, my second abortion happened at age 16. Mm-hmm. Um, I, found out that I was pregnant, you know, boyfriend that I was with for a year. And I kind of learned from my family, you know, Mm -hmm. what you're supposed to do with when something like that happens. And at the time in California, they had a Planned Parenthood on my high school campus. So I was able to go and get an abortion without parental consent. And I did. And I did. Yeah. And, um, that, you know, I, my boyfriend that was supposed to be there for me and, and show up and be, you know, give me a ride and all that wasn't. And the that experience was horrible because I did not have yeah. the health insurance and, you know, that I had before. And it was just really horrific, um, mm-hmm. just the way it was done. And um, it was definitely just an abortion clinic where there was really no it was I'll just that's like a whole nother story, but it was just really bad. And so mm-hmm. I found out that um, the next day that my boyfriend was cheating on me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so I'm like dealing with like one drama, one trauma after the next. And um, but around that time is when I started going to a church and uh, this youth program. And um my girlfriend had actually told me that there's cute guys at this church <laughs> <laughs> and these guys aren't going to like make you sell drugs for them. They're not going to beat you. They're not going to be doing all that stuff that these other knucklehead dudes are doing. Like just, you should just come. And so that was actually how I went to church because wow. I thought that there was going to be a nice guys that weren't going to do the stuff to me that these other guys were doing Mm -hmm. because I had been physically beaten in my relationships already at that point. Um, Guns held to my head. I mean, it was just really crazy. And so that's how I went to church and I, you know, met Jesus and got saved. And this was definitely the love I was looking for. And I found out about the gifts of the spirit and the, all of the things in the spirit realm that I had mm-hmm. experienced before made sense to me. And it was like, cause I, as I read the Bible, I was just like, Oh my goodness, everything makes sense now. Right. Um, but uh, the challenge was the, the church that I got saved at, there was a lot of like legalism, you know? And so I was such a, you know, broken girl. And I was trying to, I had to dress a certain way and I had to do, and and it was so hard for me to um, feel good enough or loved enough. And so I was very thankful for where I was safe because I met the Lord. But at the same time, I was so broken um, that I needed, I needed more grace than I knew was available to me. Right. And, um, and so anyway, I mean, we just, it just kind of keep going. And by, um, by age 18, I am, you know, going to college and, you know, really proud of myself because at this point I wasn't taking drugs. I wasn't drinking. I wasn't, you know, um, sleeping around. Like I was doing so good. Um, but I, found myself again in another relationship which appeared to be good but didn't end up that way um my boyfriend you know we went to church together and everything but he ended up I, I didn't know he had a porn addiction and so this porn addiction was a really dr- a huge driving force for him and he ended up raping me mm. so this was another trauma where it's like you know I'm trying to do as good as I can but then you know here's this this and this was worse than being raped by someone I didn't know, which had happened previously. Right. Um, this was I had given my heart to this person. I thought we were going to actually marry each other. He had proposed and everything. Um, and so, shortly after that, I found myself. You know, I was still living at home with family, and some stuff was happening with my family. It was like the perfect storm yeah. for me to just plummet. You know, down, 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 and I. Um, I had nowhere to live. And so I did what a lot of broken 
girls do when they don't have anywhere to live. And I became a stripper for six months. I found this strip club outside of town. And for six months, I became a stripper. And um, that's a whole nother story, all of the crazy that happens in that world. Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to, um, whenever I was done with dancing was when um, I just again found myself in a suicidal place and I was, I had just got a brand new butcher knife set from Ikea and I, um, attempted to end my life and I'm sitting there and this is a, you know, some may totally get the supernatural power of this part of my testimony that I'm about to share. And for some, this may seem really wild and really out there, but this is really what happened. Um, I was in the middle of a suicide attempt and I'm slicing at my wrist and I know where the veins are because I always loved, you know, the medical field and everything. And I'm, I am ending my life and I'm sitting there in a puddle of my blood and out of nowhere, the knife stops cutting as effectively. And it shocked me and kind of shook me. And all of a sudden, I hear the Lord speaking to me, and I see a vision come before me right in the middle of a, of a suicide attempt. Mm-hmm. And God showed me this vision of all of these broken, hurting people and in like in the nations. And there were just crowds of people, and they were swaying, and they were broken. And they were looking at me with like this eerie gaze. And, and God said to me, you can't end your life because who will reach the ones that I've created you to reach? Their lives wow. depend on it. And, and that God literally saved my life yeah. again. And I feel like he, he rescued me so many times. He is so faithful to rescue me in that moment. Um, and so I get back on track for a little while and I'm doing, I'm doing better. Um, but then another toxic relationship. So I, I struggled so much with what does healthy family and, and, and my value and my worth. And I struggled with that so much because of everything I'd been through that that actually um, affected the way that I saw God and Jesus and Holy Spirit. And so again, I'm in another relationship and another abortion, the third abortion, And, um, and now I'm like thinking, I just, I got to get out of here, you know? And so there was a lot of times that I had moved around in my life. And this time I found myself moving to Los Angeles to get into acting and modeling. I had a model management company, um, find me because of some pictures that I had online. I think it was like MySpace at the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They had seen pictures and stuff. And, um, so I got on with this management um, company and so I moved and relocated to Los Angeles and started that, that auditioning life of, you know, (laughs) going to audition after audition and, um, and also some different networking parties and things of that nature. And I thought, because I'd always loved um, dance and acting um, even as a child, uh, that was one of my outlets was dance and acting um, to escape from kind of all of the hard stuff that I was dealing with. Me too. And so, yeah, yeah, I really, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a Uh, fun community. Like, even though we're all hurting, everyone's going for fun. So like I had lots of laughs and just, it brought me a lot of joy in that community. You don't know at the time that everyone's going through something and hurting, you know? Absolutely. And it's almost like you get to be someone else and you get to focus on how to be that person instead Mm -hmm. of what you're dealing with. Um, Anyway, from a perspective of pain, that was my perspective, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, maybe from a healthy, you know, perspective that that might not be how other, you know, (laughs) people would would view, um, you know, developing characters and, and things of that nature. But Um, but yeah, so, uh, I thought that this would be, maybe this is how I could go to the world. Maybe this is how I could, you know, do something for the Lord. And, um, I ended up, you know, in some bad circles, of course, because it seemed like the dark side, (laughs) you know, was always pursuing me. And I understand why now. Um, but anyway, I ended up at a networking event in, at a, a beach home in Los Angeles. And it was for this billionaire who is a designer and his clothing lines are, you know, it's all over in, in the U S still to date, his clothing line still in stores. 
And um, I, you know, he had this reel playing during this networking event and it was, of you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous of this property in another country that was on lifestyles of the rich, of the rich and famous. And Oprah had stayed there and this is where celebrities went to vacation and things of that nature and all the clothing line and all of this. And so I actually met this man at the end of the event and then, and then that was it. Well, a couple of weeks later, some of his people, like one of his assistants, they reached out to me and they said, we would like to hire you for a modeling job. And this could turn into a contract with the clothing line. And we're going to give you all expense paid trip to that resort that I just saw that, you yeah. know, celebrities make it. So I'm thinking, this is like, this is my big break. This is the best thing ever. Right. You know, I'm young, I'm naive. I'm now I'd been through a lot of trauma and pain and abuse, but I'd never understood or heard about the world of sex trafficking. So I wasn't mm-hmm. even thinking that way. And, um, I got a ticket, um, but it happened to be a one-way ticket, which I didn't realize was a red flag. Mm-hmm. And, you know, here I go, I'm just this, you know, brand new model actress, you know, I, I'm, st- you know, the starving, <laughs> actress, right. you know, I've got a flip phone, pay as you go, like nothing fancy. Don't even put an international plan on it. Go to this country. And I'm thinking that this is the beginning of all of my, you know, dreams coming true. And I didn't realize that he actually purchased me um, wow. for him and his girlfriend. And I, again, that's a whole nother story. Um, but I, was delivered to his, his master bedroom. And there was no, um, event for the clothing line. There was, there were no photo shoots. There was no, um, it had nothing to do with the clothing line. I was lied to and tricked and coerced into a trafficking situation. And there were girls that disappeared. Um, there was a lot that happened while I was there. And, um, you know, we were taken to a few different places. And, and at, at one point there was some, some girls that actually got tickets to go home. And that's where I found out that uh, when I asked him if I could have a ticket home and I'll just pause and say this, it, it was, it took a lot to work up the courage to approach him because there was all these kind of universal laws that were established. Like you don't talk to him unless he talked to you. You don't, make eye contact with anybody you don't like there's all these universal laws like Mm -hmm. that and you would be scolded and told how illegal it was if you were out of pocket and not doing exactly what he wanted you to do so the fact that I even approached him to ask him for a ticket home was a big deal yeah and he told me um you're not going anywhere because I bought you as a Christmas gift for my girlfriend um so I was bought as a sexual you know like sex toy for his Mm -hmm. his main girlfriend and I wasn't allowed to leave until I had fulfilled what he bought me for. And, um, and she was away on holiday. So when she came back, um, uh, you know, I had to, there was all of these things that I had to do. And it was interesting because it was such a complex trauma because your brain is constantly thinking, I don't want to be picked to go to his room. Um, and, but you also just want to disconnect from everything that's happening. There was just so much going on, but she would, you know, um, was like, well, I love you from the moment I saw you from the moment I saw your picture. And so there's a lot of like brainwashing and manipulation and things Mm -hmm. that were taking place. And, um, I was only there for three weeks, but it felt like, um, it felt like a lot longer. Um, and you tell and able- a, more details for people that want to kind of really understand um, in your book, The Beloved Bride, um, you share yeah. your testimony in the end of that. And and I think what's um, just to help people understand is in that three weeks, other girls told you, like, you have to do this or you'll get beaten. Yes. So you knew what the consequences would be to say no. And you already knew Jesus, but you're in survival mode. You, your brain disassociates so that you yes. can survive. And yes. um, I've shared in the past um, my story and on my blog where I was abused by a priest as a child and how that mm. grooming keeps you yeah. um, into these patterns. And what my counselor said was that I, I had, um, I had, I did not have the ability to see warning signs. Mm. Um, yeah. So when we're abused as children. We wonder, people wonder, like, why does that stuff keep happening to you? And the difference is that our brains don't see the warning signs. 
like mm-hmm. other women who've not gone through that. Um, yeah. And then we survive it because we disassociate and we we compartmentalize it so that we can get through the painful experience, but we never want to stay in that. I, I mean, clearly in this day and age, we don't have to say that, but um, I think it was just wanted to plug that in there that your experience was horrific and you're doing such a great job of sharing it with people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll just stop talking so that you can continue no, on. No, so. that's good. I'm so glad that you said that because, you know, when you experience different forms of a, of abuse, your normal is very mm-hmm. different than what's normal. It's like a toxic mm-hmm. normal. It's a, the way you process and think mm-hmm. through things is is very different. And um, I have had so much com- compacted trauma um, over the years, you know, and right. so... Um, I actually, how I dealt with the sex trafficking was it got 100% compartmentalized and fractured mm-hmm. off. I mean, when I came home, uh, cause I convinced the girlfriend, you know, to get me a ticket home. I told her I would stay with her mm-hmm. if she let me go home. And, um, didn't you say you had something that you had to do back home and yeah, yeah. Because I had been gone for three weeks already. So I just told her, I was like, you know, I can't just like disappear because I'd I'd seen other girls disappear, yeah. Um, and like all of their belongings were still in the room, um, mm-hmm. and they were gone. And, and it was were- like almost like a laughing matter to them when I asked where did she go, right. and they're like, oh yeah, she found she must have found a boyfriend, you know. So right. I had to be very strategic with how I even approached, and in survival mode, you learn you learn how to survive the best you can. And for me, that meant being as close to her as possible, this main girlfriend, Mm -hmm. because she had his ear, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if I did anything she wanted, it was kind of like the lesser of two evils, um, honestly. And so I just did whatever she wanted me to do. And she actually took some of the more dark and twisted, perverted things that he enjoyed. She actually took that on herself because she, said that she liked it or whatever so that I didn't have to. So Mm. because she was somewhat protecting me, I actually had feelings for one of my abusers, Mm -hmm. which is Stockholm syndrome, you know, Stockholm syndrome and complex trauma. So that was very confusing. But, you know, even as I went home, whether it was consciously or subconsciously, I like that whole trafficking situation was fractured off. And I began living as if that never happened to me. Mm -hmm. Now I was definitely self-medicating, drinking again, you know, going back into, you know, numbing, uh, uh, you know, my emotional pain and all of those things and just kind of was spiraling as a hot mess for (laughs) for a little while. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was as if it never happened to me. So I was living without that part you know, fully just even aware of what happened. And, um, the next wild and crazy event in my life, I actually met a prince from Africa. I was introduced to him by, um, a magazine that I, that I was in. Somebody was like, Oh, I happen to know her and introduced me to this prince. And so I go from one end of the spectrum, you know, to, to the other. Mm -hmm. And now this man is, you know, so charming and, so, um, you know, such a gentleman and treated me, literally treated me like royalty. And I was dating him for a year and, you know, the Lord is still back there in my heart, you know, Mm -hmm. not leading my life, but, but I'm, I'm like, well, I love the Lord. Like I love him. I'm a Christian, you know, but he wasn't necessarily leading my life. Um, and so I'm living with him, with this, this boyfriend, um, and we're traveling all over the world and $30,000 shopping sprees on Rodeo Drive. And I get to meet ambassadors of nations and we're, you know, private jets. And like everything we purchased was from this suitcase of brand new cash from the bank that no, nobody was allowed to touch the cash before you know he touched it and we spent it or whatever. It was like ridiculous. Mm. But he wanted to marry me after being with him for a year. He wanted to marry me and, and, um, I just remember like thinking, okay, well maybe this is how I'm going to fulfill that calling to the Mm. nations. You know, this Mm -hmm. is how, because we were literally flying all over the world and, and living and it, and it was like, and he was just so charming and so attentive and all of these things. 
Well, I found out that there were a couple of trips that he went on that actually happened to be orgies and Uh. he had a cocaine problem. And so it was like, Oh, come on, (laughs) you know, another bad relationship. But this time, you know, Joe was really interesting. It wasn't when I was poor and it wasn't when I was trafficked that I fully surrendered to the Lord. It was when I had everything. Wow. It was when I had all of this cash and all of this money and all of this luxury and we drove dif- a different car every day and all of this luxury around me and I was literally living like a princess, but I was still empty. Yeah. That was the moment that I surrendered, fully mm. surrendered my life to the Lord. It was mm. having everything and feeling like it was it was still, it was trash if it wasn't for the Lord. I was so unhappy and that was my moment of total surrender. And um And I came to the Lord and I said, Lord, I'm tired of trying to lead my own life and trying to figure out your calling for me in my own way. And I don't care if I have to live in a cardboard box. I don't care where you want to take me, Lord. I just want to be in your perfect will. And I surrender my life completely to you. And that was the beginning of my healing and my freedom journey. And and the Lord is so gracious and so gentle and so loving and he literally, just as Second Corinthians five seventeen says, that if anyone's in Christ, they're a new person. Yeah, the old has passed away, and, and all things become new. That literally, that scripture became my reality. I've lived that out. Everything old, he began to break off and like die off of my life, and he's made everything new. And you know, I shouldn't even be alive today, but God is mm-hmm. such a miracle worker, you know, and. And it was short after, because I kind of went into what I call a God cave, Mm -hmm. where I just consumed the Bible day and night and in prayer. And all I wanted to do was to be with the Lord. And he had to undo some of the legalistic stuff that I was taught early on in Mm -hmm. my faith um, to help me really understand who he really is. And um, I just got so much freedom in that moment. I just even want to pause and say Mm -hmm. just... To those that are listening, you know, um, there's nothing that's impossible for you when you believe. There's nothing that's impossible for you when you believe in God. And um, if there's any hopelessness, if there's any situation that feels like it's a long-term hopeless situation that you haven't, you know, received breakthrough or grace or joy or freedom on yet. I just want you to know that I'm a living example that God will come through for you. And, um, and whatever miracle you need in your life, it is 100% possible through God. Uh, So I just wanted to give hope there is for those that are listening because Mm -hmm. um, God transformed my life and, and I, um, shortly after that was connected with my husband and married into full-time ministry and, um, God blessed me to be able to give birth to two incredible children. I never thought I'd be able to have babies after the trauma I endured, after mm-hmm. the abortions. But God literally healed my body and my soul and my mm-hmm. mind and made me brand new. And it's remarkable because I don't have all of the nightmares and all of the trauma that I used to live with. He's made me brand new. <laughs> so beautiful. Oh, God, you're so good. Like, yeah. it's almost like a holy moment. Like, what do we say after that? Like, yeah, just, uh, just to praise him. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Lord. I love that moment that you surrendered mm-hmm. everything. And it reminded me of the time that I was driving down a road and saying, God, I'm really tired of mm-hmm. my bi- the acting business being all about me. Mm-hmm. How skinny am I? Do I have the right song? Do I have the right connections? And, you know, I didn't play the game exactly right. And yet I was getting callbacks for Broadway shows and, you know, doing really, really well commercially on camera. And um, and I that was a moment like you. Like I was like, I don't want any of this. I finally mm-hmm. got to you work so hard and you're like, I finally got the things I wanted. And mm-hmm. I still had lots to grow. I wasn't, you know, on Broadway yet. And but I was at mm-hmm. that point. And I just said, and I had so much trauma leading up to that as well. And I just said, God, I want to work for you. Like, could you do it five minutes from my home? (laughs) Because I was tired of driving to the city for auditions. 
Yeah. And within a few months, I was on staff at a church. And that's part of my testimony that I think I've shared on a podcast. If not, it's in video. But um, I was on staff at a church and not saved. (laughs) So I'll have to tell that story another time. But I end up getting saved. And uh, that's, you know, I've been in ministry ever since. But there does come a point where you think. You walk into all the things you thought you wanted and you still feel empty. And yet you meet God and he fulfills all those inner heart desires and your soul desires that you have. And he does take away. Like I asked him, will you help me forget all the times that, you know, I did things that wouldn't please you? Like, I don't want to remember them or have them in my memory or be able to see those things I wanted to be made new. And I believe he did that. He can do those miracles in our lives. And um, even when I would talk about my abuse of my past, it's like I'm telling a story of someone else. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, that I guess that happened to me. But then my counselors helped me see some of the impact in the way I think. And we're still, you know, unpacking some of that. Um, But it's through, um, you know, Jesus. Yeah. how does someone, um, you know, we're talking about how Jesus heals, but for people that are listening that maybe are not there yet, and maybe they love God and they're like, he hasn't healed me. I want to address yeah. those people because we don't want to just say you accept Jesus and everything is okay. There's still a journey. So what would you say to someone that was, you know, that's going in that kind of season or what contributed to your healing journey? Yeah, I would say, and this is going to sound really simple, but it is 100% the, for me, my, my path for, for healing. It has been in that intimacy of the secret place of prayer and talking to the Lord and being with him and encountering him. Mm -hmm. So even when I read like the scriptures and I'm reading the Bible, I want to lean in and I want to actually experience what, what it's saying. And, and I ask questions. I talk to the Lord. I ask questions and I listen, I wait on him. There's something um, that the Bible talks about waiting on the Lord, you know, and he renews our strength and we mount up and we soar like eagles. And so in those private times of prayer, you know, um, the Lord is so faithful and he says that his sheep can hear his voice. So we can actually hear the voice of the Lord. We can see all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, there's so many accounts of visions and dreams. And um, there's so many ways that God speaks. And that's what I love so much about God, about just how multifaceted Mm -hmm. He communicates to his people and we're all different. So he speaks to us in different ways. But I, it's been those moments of just really being with him. Um, Psalm 25, 14 says that there's a private place reserved for the lovers of God where they sit near him and receive the revelation secrets of his promises. And that mm-hmm. has been key to my healing process. It has been intentionally being with the Lord and he would reveal secrets. He would reveal things to me. And a lot of it had to do with forgiving and releasing people, forgiving and releasing myself, you know, um, uh, actually, uh, and I'll just give this as, as, a something that, that I, that I found to be really powerful. And I think it's kind of overlooked, but the Lord's prayer, I feel like has been so, has become a little too common. Sometimes, you know, we kind of think, oh yeah, yeah, we know the Lord's prayer. It's posted places, but like we know the Lord's prayer, but I feel like in the Lord's prayer, when Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, um, there are, it's actually like a path to inner healing and freedom because it talks about, you know, the reality of heaven coming to earth. It talks Mm -hmm. about us forgiving and releasing people that have sinned against us. It talks, Mm -hmm. there's repentance in it. There's, you know, seeking, seeking the Lord for our daily bread and everything that we need. And so I just really spent a lot of time in the word and just in that private place of prayer and encountering him. And sometimes when you're just with Jesus and you just at moments of sensing his presence, talking to the Lord, waiting and listening. Cause if you ask him a question and you wait, 
mm-hmm. you will sense or feel or know um, an answer. He'll he'll give you an answer, Jeremiah 33 and 3. You know, when mm-hmm. you seek him, when you call out to him, and when you ask, you know, um, you know, he'll give you, he'll respond. And so in mm-hmm. those moments, you know, the Lord often would give me answers that I wasn't expecting, but I would just sit and talk to him and listen and dig deep into the word and really want to like want to glean from every angle of the word that I could. And just like with the Lord's prayer, I had a season of going through sitting and meditating on the word of God and meditating on the Lord's prayer and applying that to my life. And I, so I know I just said a whole lot, but it really came back to like prayer and and being with the Lord and encountering him. And that opened up a whole realm of uh, what I call intimacy with Jesus or knowing Jesus in such a way that um, he became like what the Bible talks about, like a husband to me, like a bridegroom to me. Um, And, you know, now it's just, just to be with him. Sometimes like, uh, sometimes I don't even have to, I don't even go through all of my petitions and my declarations and my, you know, there's different Mm -hmm. seasons, there's different strategies in every season. You know, sometimes we do need to declare. Sometimes we do just need to soak and rest. And and sometimes we need to worship sometimes. But what I've found is just, you get to a place in in getting to know the Lord where just being with him is such a delight. It's such a joy that, Whatever had me anxious or worried before, I'm not even thinking about anymore because I've been with him. Yeah. Well, and that's you know? the, um, funny enough, we, we have so many similarities in our stories that um, we don't even have time to dig in all those areas, the podcast, but um, the really my mission statement for my ministry is encouraging people to encounter the presence of God yes. um, and find yes. freedom in Christ. And, yeah, um, that's it. <laughs> it's really, I'm like so simple. And I remember when I started my ministry, I was praying and I was spending time with him. And I'm like, I feel like you've called me to start my own nonprofit. What is it about? Like, will you talk to me? And, and that was the phrase I got back then. And now that I do freedom coaching, a big piece of that is yes, I use coaching tools, set goals and all that. But in the midst of it, I help people be quiet and still and mm-hmm. hear from God. So mm-hmm. we can come up with our own plans and I we can come up with strategies, but mm-hmm. often if we're feeling anxious or insecure, um, it comes down to, God, what do you have to say? And it starts mm-hmm. sometimes with identity. Like, what do you love about me? Mm-hmm. Like, what what do you see in my life? What do you think would be the best thing to do? Um, do you have a preference, God? Sometimes he says, no. Like, what do you like? What mm-hmm. do you want? He asks me that question <laughs> time yeah Um, i love that and he helps you discover how he made you to be in that beautiful relationship of encounter looks so different sometimes it's you know practically for the listeners it's taking a walk and enjoying nature god Mm -hmm. often talks to me about what's going on in the sound of the trees or the you know the beauty of the ocean or you know all those things and um Mm -hmm. so he speaks in so many different ways and you've Mm -hmm. actually had some experiences um with visions that maybe some people Mm -hmm. haven't had that you explain in the book and um Mm -hmm. in beloved bride i've had like inner visions where i just get a picture of something and um or dreams you might have a dream and god might want to talk to you about that in the morning Mm -hmm. um and so there's so mu- so many things. We could do a different podcast just on all the mm-hmm. ways that God speaks. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, um, I'm i glad that you said that because truly I think the way that by the time I got to counseling, she couldn't believe I was already doing so well. And it really was all of my encounters with God mm-hmm. and him saying that was a lie. And even mm-hmm. in my sin, I think this is important and this is for someone I would go to the Lord and say, I'm sorry I sinned again. This is after being saved. I'm sorry mm-hmm. I did that again. And he said to me, like, not in a word in my head, but the sense, it's like a message dropped in my heart all at once, which was, I know all the reasons why you do those things. And mm-hmm. I'm not mad at you. Oh, that's so powerful. Wow. And I love you. Mm-hmm. And I'll help you. And I'm there for you. And I think a lot of times when we have reoccurring sin or we see it in other people, God knows why they do that. God knows why mm-hmm. we do that. And he loves us so well. And it's just journeying with him that eventually you don't want to do that anymore. If some people say, well, if you love him, you won't want to do it. Yeah, but when you've had intense trauma, 
you still do mm-hmm. things you don't want to do and you do really love him. So it feels very conditional. And so I want to break that off of people that think, yes, you know, like if you love him, you wouldn't do it. No, I know you yeah. love him and sometimes you still do it. And he yeah. knows that he's not putting that on you. He's just saying, come yeah. to me, come to my presence, sit with me. Let's talk about you. And yeah. let me show you who I am. Right. Yeah, I love how the Passion Translation says that scripture because it says it like this. It says, loving me empowers you Mm. to obey what I say. And so it's more like, I feel like really when we're struggling in those ways, we just need more love encounters. We just need to encounter his love more. And then as we encounter his love more, it's like you literally fall in love with him. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, oh my goodness, he just spoke something to me like, Oh, I get to go do this. Oh, it's it's this adventurous, wild, beautiful journey of being in love. And yeah. it's very different from thinking of it from a perspective of like there's some taskmaster that's going to beat you if you step out of line mm-hmm. um, and scold you and condemn you. It's, oh, I'm so in love. Like, I can't believe that I get to do this with you. You know, it's yeah. a completely different perspective. And um, I just want to say really quickly, if anybody listening like if you find that it's hard for you to hear God's voice or, and you're saying, oh, this is all really powerful, but I don't really feel like I hear God. Um, one of the things that I've seen myself and also just in working with, with girls, you know, and in our healing and praying, you know, with others is that when there's unforgiveness, um, sometimes it's hard for us to hear and receive. And so I just wanted to give that quick tip because I know that there's people listening that are really hungry to encounter God after hearing this. And like, you're excited. You want to hear, you want to experience these wonderful things we're talking about. If you find that you're bumping up against a wall, just start with asking the Lord, Lord, is there anyone I need to forgive? Do I need to forgive myself? Is there anyone I need to forgive? And names or faces or memories might pop to your mind and just start there by forgiving and releasing and then talk to them again, you know, and just, and then have fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Give that strategy real quick. Cause oh, it's, so it can be discouraging when you're trying and you feel like you're not getting anywhere, but I'm telling yeah. you every single time that has brought a breakthrough to hear and encounter mm-hmm. the Lord. Oh, that's so good. Um, and uh, gosh, I'm like looking at our time going, oh, we should stop talking because, hey, listener, hopefully you're still enjoying it. We promise there's still some goodies that we want to share. So don't leave us yet. Um, But forgiveness is one of the first things I do with my clients because it does break things off and opens doors. And Mm -hmm. we feel like we're powerful when we don't forgive because we're in control, but we Mm -hmm. actually can't receive what God has. You know, it's the open hands analogy that if you're holding mm-hmm. on to the person you're mad at, you can't be open to God grabbing your hand and helping you up. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so forgiveness is huge. And I do, I'm going to offer this to anyone. If you need the steps to walk through forgiveness in a way that we've been talking about, where you talk to God and ask questions, email me at jill at jillmonaco.com and I will send you the chapter on forgiveness out of my book, The Freedom Coach Model where I tell you what questions to ask God and how to listen to him. And then gives you a place to just journal and walk through that process. And then has a prayer at the end. Um, Sometimes we need to forgive others, forgive ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes Mm -hmm. we need to forgive God for not showing up like we wanted him to, even though he doesn't need our forgiveness. We don't, he hasn't done anything wrong. Um, But there's, it just heals your heart. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned forgiveness. That is really huge. That's so beautiful. What a gift that you're giving to the listeners today. That's so beautiful. That's going to be a powerful tool that that they can use for the rest of their lives. I mean, I always go back to it. So that's really good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Me too. I walk through it myself. And you know what? Like in a lighter note, guys, every time I'm about to teach on forgiveness, somebody does something to me that week. Oh, of course. That's always uh, how it works. (laughs) Like I need to forgive them, you know, and it's so hard because nothing in your flesh wants to do it. Um, And you're like, but if they hadn't done that, I wouldn't be feeling this way. But oftentimes we feel a certain way because there's an injury already there. And um, I'm taking, Mm -hmm. as I've gotten older, I'm taking more control of my emotions. When things happen Mm -hmm. to me, they don't happen in me. So Mm -hmm. 
Um, I do want to mention something um, uh, about your book in uh, The Beloved Bride. I encourage you all to go get it. It's a journey into deeper intimacy with Jesus. And she shares um, biblical tons of scripture and then stories and testimonies of what God has done and then gives you a challenge for you to talk to God and hear him. So it's a beautiful book. Can you tell people where they can find it? Sure. You can look up His Beloved Bride on Amazon, or you can also get it on through my website at ZulaScouse.com. Good. And where can people connect with you on social media? Uh, yeah. Actually, if you just go to my website, all my social links are right at the top. And okay. so you can connect with me and on whatever you, uh, whatever way you connect to the world, whatever. I know some people are like, I'm not on that anymore, but I'm only on this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. all the links are up there at silascouse.com to connect and I uh, oh, love okay. love to hear from you. <laughs> it's so good. Well, there's one other thing I want to address um, before we wrap this up, and it was something you said earlier, like you've discovered why these things kept happening to you, and and I had mentioned we didn't have that early warning sign. Um, Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you and and the people listening that I asked God one time, I said, Mm -hmm. you know what, I'm so tired of all the warfare. Like, this is me Mm -hmm. in ministry. I'm not being abused anymore. But, you know, I had tons of warfare, like from Christians. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like from the body of Christ in the church. And I'm like, God, and I actually asked this question. I said, God, why am I so important to the enemy that he finds me worthy of attacking? Like mm-hmm. I am a small ministry. I don't have, I don't don't feel like I have a big reach. You know, all those things where you don't, even if we affect one, it's important. But I didn't feel important enough. And mm-hmm. God said to me, I have a better question I want you to ask me. Why are you so important to me? Ooh, wow. That's so good. Yes. Right? Because, yes, it's so good. And I think that if we always focus on the enemy and the negative things in, in our lives or things that have happened to us. And we wonder, why is he doing that? We give more attention to the enemy than he deserves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I actually think that it's the redemption, um, uh, God, like the redemption of God that we encounter more of heaven than mm-hmm. of the enemy. Yeah, And that's what I get to enjoy now is I get to encounter more of him and have more mm-hmm. heavenly encounters than anything else on the other side. And the Lord's taught me how to shift that and how to continue to shift my eyes and my focus on Him. And it does, it changes everything. It really does. Yeah. And a fully yielded and surrendered heart, you know, um, when you when you come to that place, you really do see how how much more fun it is to encounter mm-hmm. heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so much more fun. And when you ask Him questions like, why am I important to you, God? He's going to tell yeah. you and yes. you'll feel inspired. And then all that other stuff just feels like, you know, you're walking through a cloud of gnats or something. You're just annoyed. But, yeah. you know, you yeah. just like brush them off because they're so small. Um, oh, that's so good. Well, I know we we should have just, you know, had a whole other podcast because we can just keep talking about I know, how I awesome like God I is. I know. I talk to you forever <laughs> just about the Lord because he is. He's so good. He's so good. <laughs> I'm so glad that we had this time together today. Thank you very much for being a guest on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. This has been really special. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Jill Monaco Show. And and if you did, there's a few things that I want you to do. And there's a few things I want to mention that I want to give you. So first, if you enjoyed it, I would love for you to rate it and review it. It helps this podcast be organically found by other people that might be looking for this content. But you can really help by sharing it. Share it with a friend. Share it with someone who needs to be encouraged to hear God's voice or to overcome trauma, and they need to hear that someone else has already gone through it like Sula. And one of the things I want to offer you as well is there are tons of free resources on my website at jillmonaco.com. Like I said, if you want that chapter on how to forgive, email me at jill at jillmonaco.com. I also have a free audio download and workbook uh, that's called Living Free. And I talk about the pattern of how you think and feel and your beliefs and, and how to untangle lies and find God's truth and hear God's voice. It's totally free on my website, jillmonaco.com slash living dash free. 
Like I said, it's audio and a workbook. There's free courses on there, um, but you can also get some audio courses on overcoming. I talk about overcoming fear, uh, jealousy, self-doubt, and uh, one other one that I can't remember. I always do that when I mention it. There's four really (laughs) good ones. (laughs) Um, And so there's other things you can purchase on there. And if you've been blessed at all by this ministry, I would like to humbly ask you if you would support it financially. In 2020, we have really big ideas and dreams of things that we want to do for the kingdom to help people encounter God's presence and find freedom in Christ. So we would love your partnership. Again, you can go to jillmonico.com slash donate and uh, help us out there today. Okay, well, my friends, I am so glad you joined us. I hope you were inspired. I hope you felt the presence of God on our conversation. And if you need any of the links to anything we mentioned today, you'll also find that on this episode of the podcast. So find that at jillmonico.com slash podcast. Okay, I love you so much, my friends. And remember, love well. You were made for